thank you again for uh, just his heart, and we um, pray all these things in your name. Amen. Our reality is characterized by perpetual competition. Most people think of sports when they think of competition. Sports demonstrate the love of competing within our society and within our culture. Sports date back to around 3,000 years ago, where hunters were trained to hunt and warriors to fight. Over time, they became more complex, while also growing in popularity. The first Olympics, which included running, chariot races, throwing javelin, jumping, and discus, were held in 776 BC. Today, sports are a billion-dollar industry and are expected to be valued at almost $350 billion worldwide by the year 2031. But why? Why are we willing to invest so much in artificial competition? Why are we willing to put our time, money, and energy into sports? This all comes down to one thing, human nature. We want to compete. We need to compete. As humans, God has given each and every one of us an inherent love of competition. So, the question must be asked, how are we to understand this love and store it as he intended? Before we begin, we must define worldly competition. According to the Oxford Dictionary, competition is the striving against one another to gain or win something. We see this throughout our society, whether it's sports teams battling for victory, or businesses for revenue, or even individuals looking for opportunities and notoriety. This is clearly a very valued thing within our culture. And though it's valued, and though it can lead to many good things, it can also lead to harmful things. For instance, we've undoubtedly heard the tale of the dad coaching from the sidelines, or even the extreme of parents fighting from opposing stands, or the worst, when there's that one mom who thinks her child is the best thing to ever be put on the planet and will not stop until you and everyone else knows it too. Although we laugh, it nevertheless happens frequently within sports culture. The opposite is stated in the Bible. According to Matthew 22:37, where Jesus says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the laws and the prophets. Sometimes when we play sports, we get so caught up in winning and competing that we forget these two simple commandments to love one another. As Christians, it's important to remind ourselves each and every day to practice restraint in times of intense competition so that we can follow what Jesus commands us to do in the New Testament. Now, let's talk about the scientific advantages of competition. When our brains achieve something great, our brains release the chemical dopamine, or the feel-good chemical. A recent study at Vanderbilt University looked more into how our minds react to competition. In it, they found that this very chemical dopamine is released when we compete, especially when we win. Our bodies feel a rush of energy, and over time, we tend to get addicted to this, almost leading to an addiction to competition. And though competition has existed since the start of time, and is not just about winning, our ancestors had to hunt for food, look for water, find places to build shelter. If they lost, they couldn't go home. There was no, we'll get them next time. Competing for them was a life or death experience. God gave us this desire to compete because the desire to compete was directly related to the survival of our species. Now that the fundamental advantages of competition have been discussed, it's crucial to keep in mind that there's a difference between worldly competition and spiritual competition. For my interview, I had the opportunity to speak to Coach Steve Gomez, the head women's basketball coach at Lubbock Christian University. When Coach Gomez has won a Division II Women's Basketball Coach of the Year Award, as well as seven conference championships in the last 10 years. And to top that off, he's won three Division II Women's National Championships. When asked about the role competitiveness plays in Christianity, Coach Gomez said the following. True competition in its purest form is trying to be as good as you can be in order to make yourself better. Due to the negative overtones competition may elicit, many Christians are weary to take it. When asked about this, Coach Gomez pointed me to 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, where Paul writes, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it for a perishable wreath, but we are imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. 
In this verse, Paul describes how we can obtain rewards in heaven and how we should live our lives out to achieve success through the process of sanctification. However, what is sanctification and what are the rewards that Paul is discussing? Someone's desires, needs, and thoughts change when we become a believer. This is due to the Spirit entering in us and assisting in our behavioral transformation. Sanctification sets us free from the holds that sin has on us. Though it does not lead, though it does not lead to save us from death as justification does, rather it's an essential component of our faith. We see this in Galatians 2.20, where it's written, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This demonstrates the process of sanctification in Paul's life. It's important to remind ourselves that sanctification is not something that happens overnight. This is a lifelong ordeal. At this time, the Greek Olympics were a significant event in Greece. Athletes would put in countless hours, and though the hours were rigorous, their sacrifice was far outweighed by their victory of fame and glory. Paul is saying that when we compete with ourselves we, to be the best Christians we can be, we can share the gospel and obtain these rewards in heaven. Now, looking back at 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, it is important to realize that Paul is not discussing worldly rivalry. Rather, he is defining competition in terms of Christianity by addressing his own internal conflicts. Here's where Coach Gomez's response became init- from to the initial question regarding the role becomes clear. As Christians, our goal is not to beat everybody to God's doorstep. It's not to tear down others and try in, in the pursuit of improving ourselves. As Coach Gomez stated, our aim as Christians is to compete against ourselves, not just for ourselves, but to help others and love God and love others. To learn more about this topic, I read How Champions Think by Dr. Bob Rotella. Dr. Rotella is a secular sports psychologist who has assisted some of the greatest athletes in the world, such as LeBron James, as well as other successful musicians and entrepreneurs, in realizing their aspirations. In this book, Bob Rotella talks about an old football coach who said, you have to be willing to go through the fire. As stated in this quote, failure is a part of success. However, it does not equate to success. But if we don't make mistakes or take the opportunity to make mistakes, how can we learn from them? You may be asking me now, Faden, what relevance does this have in the place of Christian competition? Returning to what Paul said about the race, he asked how one wins the race without training for it, and how one improves without failing. We must fail, take the risk, and step into the fire in order to grow, to live better lives for Christ. That is one aspect, in my opinion, that makes MCA such a great learning atmosphere. Our tutors at MCA encourage us to take on challenging things because it's important for us to fail because failure breeds, breeds growth. At, during our junior year of American history, we discussed the space race. One of the most prominent figures in the space race was President John F. Kennedy. In a speech at Rice University, JFK emphasized the significance of the space race as well as our motives behind it, saying, but why Sam say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may as well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon in this decade, not because that it will be easy, but because it will be hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. I believe this quote shows competitiveness in the same light that MCA, Dr. Rotella, and God wants us to seek it in. We compete against ourselves because it's difficult. Because at the end of the day, life is difficult, the world is difficult, and the race is difficult. But just as Kennedy intended on that sunny day on September 12, 1962, we intend to win. Some may wonder, why compete if it can lead to hatred? Why compete if it's difficult? Why compete if it can lead to misunderstanding within our faith, just as so many other Christian concepts have. And while this is a valid question, Paul gives us a valid answer in 2 Timothy 1.7, where he writes, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. This verse demonstrates that when we compete under Christ, we compete through love, not hate. It shows that we can overcome because God has given us the power to overcome. It shows us that pride will not seep into our relationship with, the, with, 
with the Lord because we have self-control. This idea of self-control is one of the most important aspects when it comes to spiritual competition as well as worldly competition. Self-control helps a person stay in check and keep their attention on the task at hand. Because if we don't pay attention to the task at hand, how can we focus on the goal in the, at the end? For instance, in Joshua 5, 6, we see the opposite of what we should do with self-control. In Joshua 5, 6, he writes, For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness, until all the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. The Lord swore to them that he would not let them see the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give us, a land flowing in milk and honey. The Israelites made the decision to reject God's promise at this specific time in the Bible because they were afraid of the Canaanites. God punished the Israelites by sending them out into the wilderness for 40 years because of their lack of self-control. On the other hand, we hear stories like those told in the book Fox's Book of Martyrs, a book we read in World History One, in which, discur- in which discusses the early Christian martyrs. The book recounts depressing and horrifying tales with ho- horrific atrocities committed in each of them. But despite all the suffering, difficulty, and dread described in the book, the martyrs finished their race through their love of God while using the power he gave them to stand up for truth, even as they met their fate. My aim for this oral was to shed a new light on competition, one that promotes active competition rather than condemning it. Competition and failure through competition is the only way to evolve. During my four years at MCA, I had the opportunity to play on the baseball team. After our games, no matter what the statistic or outcome, our baseball coach, Coach Morrison, always told us that we can do better and that we can always improve. Now, sure, this may be an intense sport like baseball, But why can't we apply that to our own lives? Why can't we compete to improve ourselves and improve others to ensure the kingdom of God? It's important to... Bob Rotella writes in his book, it's important to understand the difference between diligence and perfectionism and to stay on the diligent side of the line. It is important to remember, we are not perfect. We never will be. Even if we try and try and try, we will never be able to achieve perfection. But as Dr. Rotella states, we can put in effort and be diligent within our lives to follow God and follow his commandments, as well as love others, and to remember that we are all trying in a world where mistakes are easy to make. Perfectionism is impossible, is impossible and that is why we have Christ. And since the Lord is ultimately what counts, let us run the race in our own lives. Let us not run it poorly or lackluster or carelessly, but rather let us run it to win, so that one day, just as Paul did in 2 Timothy 4, 7, we can look back on our lives and say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Thank you. Great job. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we'll start off with some softballs here. Uh, So what are your future plans? I'm going to Texas Tech University, and I plan to major in business, general business right now. Sorry. Uh, But yeah, those are my plans. Very good. So um, there's this rumor out there about you that you play the guitar, and you play it well, and you perform. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's a rumor because I still haven't seen any videos (laughs) of that. Um, But let's say that Texas Tech and your, uh, your degree doesn't really work out for you, and you dropped out of school, you know, like one John Denver. Uh, what would be your uh, assumed um, perform- performer name? East and West. East and West? Okay. <laughs> All right, one more, one more softy. Uh, if you could perform um, in the big house, like Michigan's football stadium, mm-hmm. or the Grand Old Opry, which one would you choose? The big house, because okay. I've been there before. Okay. But, All right. I mean, the Grand Old Opry's cool, but it's just like a stage, so. Yeah. <laughs> All right, talk us through your process for arriving at this thesis. I think that's an interesting journey. Well, I really didn't know what I wanted to write about at first, but I knew what I like enjoyed doing. And I knew, like competition is such a prevalent thing within my life just because I enjoy it so much. Kind of like what I was talking about, like some people just get addicted to competition. And that's something that was like important to me in my life, just watching sports as well as just like, Uh, pursuing greatness like my quote on my senior page is like mca not only 
like taught me what excellence was, but how to pursue it. And I think that's like part of competition is pursuing that excellence. And so over time, it just really like ended up morphing into this. It's kind of like a cluster of a bunch of things that came together. Okay. Um, so talking about competition, uh, I know you have uh, a few brothers that are here in the audience. Mm-hmm. Do you have any memorable stories from your childhood growing up with competition? Oh, I knew you were going to ask this one. <laughs> um, yes. So people who know me know I am not good at basketball. Like, I am, like, worse than, like, worst. Like, the worst. You're not good? Yeah, like, I'm bad. And so I decided I was going to play Kaysen in basketball one time at the court down the street. And so we go over there, and me and Kaysen are playing. Like, playing, like, Kaysen's, like, destroying me. So, like, bullying, basically. <laughs> um, but Kaysen was also shorter than me at this time. Like, he was a little kid. And so I decided, you know what? If I'm not going to win, at least I'm going to go out swinging. (laughs) And so I just grabbed him and threw him against the side of it. And I felt really bad afterwards, but (laughs) since he didn't get hurt, it was kind of (laughs) funny. Well, that is a good uh, segue into my next line of questioning, which is talking about this idea of restraint, you know, Mm. which might have been useful there. Yeah, it was Uh, not there. Yeah, yeah. So you talked about this idea of we have competition, but within competition, there's this idea of loving God and loving others. Um, so you said, uh, you know, exercising restraint in situations when there is intense competition in order to love God and love others. Can you explain that idea a little bit more? So when we compete, I feel like there's a line for everything. And that's when it passes like what God has told us to do and what God has commanded us to do. So if we're not loving God and loving others, like the competition is kind of useless in a lot of ways. And I would say that because I think competition personally, it brings me closer to God. Like when I compete, like the way I would describe it is like competing makes me feel alive, like the most alive. And so I feel like something that makes you feel alive is probably God given. And so if you're passing that line of like godliness, that's where I would draw the line on competition. But practicing restraint, meaning like, like, like you said, uh, if, if we're crossing that line, then there's really no point. Okay. There's a lot of things I would like to go in there, but I'm going to keep pressing into this idea. If I'm an athlete and I'm exercising restraint, am I not then inherently giving my opponent an edge? No, because I don't think like competition it depends on which, like, what restraint is. And like I said, like, what is your limit and what are you restraining from? And I would say that's like restraining from going over that boundary. And so if you're not going over that boundary, there's nothing like inherently wrong with it really in a lot of ways. But with that said, I, I think most sports, to be good at sports, you don't have to cross that boundary. And to be good, like to be a good competitor, you don't have to cross that boundary. In fact, a lot of the best competitors that we look out at, like in the MLB or the NFL, I don't watch the NBA because it's chauvinistic. You're not but, good at basketball. <laughs> <laughs> um, but even in like other atmospheres, like college basketball, college baseball, college football, some of the best athletes that we see who are winners are good people too. And they, they, they won't go that far. For instance, when we see like, um, goodness, what's his name on the Bills this year, get hurt? Oh, yeah, Demar Hamlin. Like they didn't just keep playing that game. Like that was mm-hmm. part of that restraint. Okay. Um, so you know, at MCA, we like to think that we're different. We like to think that we've got this kind of culture and community. So, you know, we go to the basketball game and we're watching the boys play or the girls play. But what I'm curious about is. How, what is a like a, a a way to cheer our teams on in a way that loves God and loves others while also still being passionate without crossing that line? Yeah. Cause so we well because we you know one of us goes over there to the student section and is like okay calm down everybody but why did we like where's that line for us? Mm-hmm. So in my paper I talked about how. Um, this idea of spiritual competition, which I think we should all aspire to, it's not about just building, like it's about 
it, it's not about deteriorating others, and I put that in my paper. Um, I can't find it at the moment, but I put it in my paper. <laughs> um, but yeah, like loving God and loving others and pursuing Christ without deteriorating others. And so I think there's a difference between like cheering your team on and tearing the other team down, if that makes sense. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, but referees are fair game. I'll pass the mic. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think about that? Referees? Yeah, what about well, referees? <laughs> so me and Park recently have been pursuing our career as umpires for Pony League. <laughs> And I will say, we were only trying to be good people and, you know, call the game fair, but the parents still yelled at us. And so I, I, it's, it's really the same thing. Like, they're people too. Like, we still need to love them. And just like the Bible says. Okay. All right. Okay. I think I'll pass it on that one. Great job, Thayden. Thank you. I'm going to continue on uh, Mr. Snell's train. Um, so say that we find ourselves competing and um, we can see that it's kind of bringing out the worst in us rather than the best, like some of those examples you gave, um, or even being at our kids' games and we find ourselves yelling at the uh, officials. Um, do you think it's better to uh, kind of abstain from competition at that point? Um, do you think that that the, uh, I guess the cons kind of outweigh the pros if you find yourself in that situation. Yeah, so I think if you're competing in the wrong way, then you should probably not be competing. Like, I, I'm not saying that you can never compete again, but like, inform like we've all competed and like gone a little over. And so when, when we get to that point, it's important to set ourselves down. It, it's just like penalties in sports. Like, there's a reason why those are in there. Because once you go past the rules and once you break the rules, then let's say, like in hockey, they put you in the penalty box. Or uh, in, in soccer, they give you a red card. It's like that. Like, um, once you go past the boundaries of the rules, whether it's the rules in the sport or the rules of the Bible, I think you need to be set in time out, basically. <laughs> so... Say you've committed to play, you know, varsity for an entire season mm -hmm. um, of baseball, and then you find yourself in that situation, um, and you're a starter. Is it fair to put your teammates in jeopardy of losing um, to remove yourself from the team, or say, hey, this is just not something I can take right now? Yeah. So, I think as Christians, we need to try to build Christian cultures, whether that's in teams or not in teams, or like in sports or not in sports. But I think like as a teammate, like if you're going past that boundary and you're like overdoing what you need to be doing in sports, I think it's better for the team as a whole probably not to have you there just because it can lead to a bad culture and that can lead to other kids going past this boundary. Have you been on a team like that before where and obviously don't name any names, but <laughs> uh, where you were a teammate um, was in a bad spot and you feel like that would have maybe benefited the team as a whole? I don't know if I've necessarily been on a team like that. I think there's like certain days, like, yeah. It's just like, like I mean, kids have gotten kicked out of practice, you know, and so things like that, but not like, as just a culture, but I've definitely seen teams with cultures like that. Like, it's like, um, when you have too many people who want to be the best, I think that's an example of that. Like, too many people who care more about themselves being the best than the team being the best it can be. Um, so yeah, that, that's just an example, but I've seen, definitely seen teams like that. I've never personally been on a team where that's the culture, at least not yet. Um, but yeah. Okay. Last kind of in this little uh, run of questions, I'm going to be a parent soon, and I'm assuming my son is going to want to play sports. Um, but how do I, as a parent, kind of discern um, the the culture that I want my son to play those sports in, and then kind of in connection to that, how do I, as a parent? help create the culture that um, I want my son to play sports in? Mm -hmm. So I think 
as a parent, it's important to find kids, especially while they're young, finding kids with other good parents. Because it's kind of like the thing, you, you become who you hang out with. So if your kid's a good kid, you know these kids have good parents. And obviously that's not perfect, because like, they, kids, can, kids will uh, rebel. But um, I think, yeah, as parents, like finding good parents with teams, especially while they're young, so that that team can grow together, or like your kids can grow together with them, and, and as parents, growing as parents together. Um, and having like-minded values. I think that's important. And then what was the next part of your question? I think, I don't think, that, I think oh, that answered. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. All, All right, right. <laughs> Okay, so kind of along these lines, um, I want to ask you, uh, why are professing Christians such bad sports? <laughs> professing Christians, can you... Right, so uh, a professor, someone who, uh, yeah. What is this uh, uh, Christian? <laughs> um, so, you know, someone who, who says that they're a Christian, mm. right? Yeah, but, yeah. But, but you, you take them to a sports arena and they behave exactly the same as everybody else, generally speaking. Yeah. Right, not, not all the time. But why is that? What is that revealing? I mean, I think sports are fallen just like everything else in our world. Like, people are fallen. And so when you get them around other people like that, then I think, you know... In a lot of ways, that can lead to that. And it just a lot of the sports culture, kind of like what I was talking about, about the parents, uh -huh. um, like the mom, for example. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and, and here I say, although we laugh about it, it nevertheless happens frequently within sports culture. Right. And so I think sports culture, in a lot of ways, as time goes on, and even at the beginning, it's always been, and me and Mr. Snell have talked about this during our senior meetings a lot, like sports have always been this way, like people taking it too far. And that's because sports, like sports culture has fallen because sports culture is ran by fallen people. Okay. So, so you, you talk in here about low sports are a good thing, mm -hmm. but then kind of the counter argument would be like our culture is too sports crazy, um, that the modern stadium is actually the house of worship for many people. Mm -hmm. like this one. So what do you think kind of, uh, what do you think sports, um, how, what role does it play in people's identity? Hmm. I mean, I can say from, it, it can become an idol in a lot of ways, and I think it has for a lot of people. Um, kind of like what Hannah was talking about, like sports can become your life, and when that happens, right. it's not a good thing. Um, can you ask your question again? Yeah, well, let, let me give you an example. And I have a friend who's not mm. a big fan of, of team sports, and mm. we've talked about this over the years. And, and he pointed out how it's, it's weird for, let's say, like a 50-year-old man to be wearing the shirt of a – 18 year old kid or a 22 year old kid you know like the mm -hmm. jersey yeah there's, there's kind of an interesting if you if you step out of the sports arena it's kind of strange like what mm -hmm. does that say you're walking through an airport and you see a 50 year old man and he's wearing like the jersey of a 24 year old yeah um i don't think if anything's an if anything's an idol in your life mm -hmm. it shouldn't be there okay and if you have to restrain from that even if it's something like i love sports like i i genuinely love sports Okay, a so lot. I'm going to go so, ahead and jump in right then, then. Okay. So what is the sport that if, if the Lord said, I want you to give up being focused on that sport, what would, what would be that one that would be so hard? I think the hardest, like playing-wise, would be baseball. Okay. The hardest to watch would be college football. Okay. Um, but yeah, that, that's definitely the most difficult. And I will say, like, I definitely struggle with it, right. uh, like almost idolizing that. Well, I way. think going to Tech next year might cure you of the college football. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That worked out beautifully. Yeah, all right. How did A&M do this year? <laughs> <I'm just kidding>. hey. <laughs> oh, so you got me. Well, like, I don't know A&M loses. I mean, come on. I, I, already, I already knew that. So, but uh, this is not my thesis. All right. Okay. Um, so when it comes to, you know, I guess competition, I, wa I wanted to read you a quote from Screw Tape Letters. Okay. Okay. And so, um, and you remember this is from Screw Tape, so he's a demon. Yeah. Okay. Right. Sure. And so this is what he says. He says, the whole philosophy of hell rests on recognition of the axiom that one thing is not another thing, and especially that one self is not another self. My good is my good, and your good is yours. What one gains, another loses. Even an inanimate object is what it is by excluding all other objects from the space it occupies. If it expands, it does so by thrusting other objects aside or by absorbing them. 
A self does the same. With beasts, the absorption takes the form of eating. For us, it means the sucking of will and freedom out of a weaker self into a stronger. To be means to be in competition. Mm-hmm. Okay. So do you remember that when it, from Screw Tape? Letter? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So I guess because we talk, we use that language even in sports, mm-hmm. right? Like we're going to take the will yeah. out of the other person, right? <laughs> yes, we're going to take the fight out of them. It's that same kind of demonic language that's mm-hmm. used there. So how can we compete in a way that isn't demonic? Hmm. Huh. It's a good question. Um, I would say sports, like, hmm. I guess in a little bit, oh, man, this is hard. This is tough. Um, so by demonic, you mean that, like, taking away from one and giving it to the other. Yeah, right, because that's what he talks about. So, mm. so how are we playing sports in a way that's not just like, I, I want to crush you. Like, I want to yeah. break your will. I, I want you to, because that's what he's saying mm-hmm. here. And I would say that's a lot of the language that's used in sports. Yeah. Right, yeah. okay. Um, so I would go back to, like, the idea of sportsmanship, okay. stuff like that, and, like, the betterment of – of yourself, but also others. Like when you're competing with somebody else, you're getting better, but they're also getting better at, at the same thing. And so like that idea of sportsmanship, like we don't have to be, you know, we don't have to treat everybody we play against like they're the enemy necessarily. Um, and I, I mean, I would definitely say like in a lot of ways, that's how I look at it like while I'm playing, which is a problem. But I think that idea of sportsmanship and like sports, like they're a game. Right. Like, it's not life or death, like we talked about before. Like, sports are for fun. Sports aren't for... You're not going to die if you lose a sports game. Right. Um, Unless it's the Hunger Games, I guess. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but... <laughs> whatever floats your boat. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's good. And I think that, um, like, you guys played Covenant this year. Yeah. And they were very good. Yeah, they were very good, but they were also great sports. Yeah, that's and what so I that's heard. They weren't, they weren't jerks about it. Yeah. yeah. And so, for instance, like, I would say... Like, I got better in that game. And it also goes to the idea of failure, too. Like, you're going to fail. Yeah. And, like, through, like, even just through the season in general, like, we struggled at times. But I definitely learned. I learned as much this year, maybe more than I have in years that we were winning. And so, it, if that, like. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Absolutely. Very good. All right, I'm going to pass the mic. Thanks, Dave. Which direction to go? So, have you heard of uh, this kind of recent movement i would say to kind of end uh handshake lines at the end of professional games you know like hockey is kind of famous for their yeah. handshake line and you know basketball you line up in front of the scorers table you go across to shake hands good mm-hmm. game you know baseball does it too yeah have you heard of um this kind of movement lately to ban them because of the kind of the fights that have been breaking out in them i have not okay oh. well it's out there espn talks about it a lot what do you what's your take on that you know should we should we just end these because these coaches are getting into it at the end or these or these star players are starting to throw punches it happened with um like uh I think it was the Louisville women's team in the NCAA tournament lately. Like, should we just end this because nothing good is coming out of it? Or what's your thought on that? I mean, I would say that, like, loses the point of sports. When we, when we lose ourselves in competition, kind of like idolizing it, when we idolize the win so much to the point where we're, we're willing to do whatever it takes, and I want to win. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I want to win. Like, if you're, if you're competing, like, winning is, winning is part of competing. You can't compete if you don't want to win. But if we're going past that boundary and past the point of restraint, then I think I think that like the whole points of sport, like the whole point of the sport is lost. And so like handshaking, like if we're really just going to get rid of handshaking and just sportsmanship in general, which is really kind of what it comes down to. If we're just going to get rid of sportsmanship, then why have sports? Hmm. Yeah, good answer. Well, I want to talk a little bit. You said, uh, you know, if you're going to, basically you said, if you're going to play, you should play to win. Yeah. Which I agree with you. Um, but, you know, there's a, uh, there's a lot of failure that happens in sports. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of want to direct this towards the spiritual side of things in your paper and this idea of competing against yourself. Um, you know, this process of sanctification that you talked about, uh, you know, is a really interesting one. Can you explain sanctification again? 
Yeah, so the way, and this isn't in my paper, but the way I would define it is like the process of being set apart for something holy. And so like, this is not, like I said, um, it's not like something that happens overnight. Like this is a process over time, and getting closer to Christ and getting closer and that basically changing the changing the way that you are basically just changing yourself will, sort of. will we ever fully become like christ in our earthly lifetimes no okay so you know i could probably call that a failure at being sanctified if i hmm. don't make it all the way like why what why should i try because if i know i've got you know however many years of life ahead of me just spent toiling because because our life isn't bound by earth okay our ba- our lives aren't bound by this world and so like after life so there's justification, sanctification, and glorification. You are my New Testament. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. We've been over this. Um, so justification, as I talked about uh, in my paper, is basically Christ was sent down to be justified for our sins. And so our sins are washed away. Uh, sanctification is this process that I just talked about. And glorification is within the afterlife and being glorified in the rewards. And I unfortunately did not put the name or put the word glorification within my favor but yeah, you know what up here that's important so you you did talk about in your paper kind of the there will be eternal rewards for for this process of sanctification mm-hmm. right um and i like what you said you said uh being set apart um the process of being set apart to be holy uh are there any earthly rewards that we see out of the sanctification process hmm. or is it just all kind of in the future we will see it someday i mean this is kind of a cheesy line, but like enjoying the grind. <laughs> um, but like, is that like a coffee joke or what? <laughs> I don't even know if I said that right, but whatever, whatever. Um, Ex- explain that idea, enjoying the grind. Uh, I actually want to change the word. <laughs> um, um, enjoying the work. Okay. So uh, Paul talks about, I think it's Paul talks about uh trials and tribulations and how we can find re- like rejoice in them and so like living living for christ is a privilege mm-hmm. like it's not just something that we just do like it's a privilege to do that and so i i would say that's a reward in itself being able to live for christ and having having the bible is another gift that we're given but like through sanctification um going through these trials and tribulations and going through this hardship like that is that's a gift of sanctification within itself. Okay, trials and tribulations. You read my mind. James chapter 1. You're probably familiar with it, right? All right, so uh, verse 2 and, and uh, well, we'll just read 2 through 4, and I'll let you respond with your thoughts afterwards. Consider it all joy, my brother, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What do you think about that? I mean, I... I think it says what it says, but um, yeah, I think... What do you mean by that? So it's kind of like what I just said, like rejoicing in in the struggle. Like, uh, I don't want to say that word again, (laughs) but um, yeah, just rejoicing in the struggle and like living our lives for Christ is a privilege. It's hard. Like I talked about in here, like the race is difficult. Like the race that Paul talks about in here, it's not easy, but... There are gifts through that, and that gift, sometimes struggle is a gift, and sometimes failure can be a gift, mm-hmm. like, I, like I talk about in my paper, because we can grow from it, and we can get closer to Christ, and that's basically the process of sanctification summed up. Very good. Yeah, I, I agree with that a lot. I like how it says uh, that, you may be, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, and I think you've done a good job of expressing you know, that is something that we're aiming for, uh, that will be realized when we... Uh, are in heaven with the Lord and have glorified bodies, that glorification, salvation. Um, but yeah, you've given me motivation to become more sanctified. So in your paper, you talk about how um, Paul kind of tells us that we should compete against our old self, right, mm-hmm. to, to constantly become better um, in, in the process of sanctification. Um, and I think most people who know you have heard you talk about your old self a bit, um, maybe your public school self, or I don't know. I've heard I've heard tell <laughs> in geometry of that. Um, can you kind of just uh, tell us 
what um, the sanctification process has looked like for you personally, maybe in the last couple of years? Yeah, so I would say like seventh, eighth grade year were probably like some of the hardest times of my life. Just like, just like most seventh and eighth grade years are the hardest times of like everybody's life. Um, but just like not living for God, like kind of turning away for, from him, like almost resenting him in a way without like caring, if that makes sense. Like uh, just, I, yeah, just not caring really about it. Um, and so I would say through MCA is probably the biggest part of it. And just like the process of learning more about God and, uh, and struggling and like, I, I like almost failed a class. I, I, I failed a class, basically failed a class my uh, eighth grade year. Sorry, mom. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think through that like process, that failure was probably one of the most important things thus far in my life, like learning. That failure, wanted, it made me want to succeed more because I failed. Um, and so I think just the failure over and over again. And then you get to MCA, and it's even harder. I'm not going to say that, but uh, yeah, it's, it's even more difficult. Like the schoolwork is more difficult, um, and, but we have revisions, of course. And so, and the revisions obviously take time. And so MCA is a lot of a time game. Like, are you willing to put in the work? Um, and so going through that failure and having to learn how to work hard uh, I would say that's like the biggest part of sanctification, just like being becoming informed on how like how to succeed, if that makes sense. Because I don't I don't necessarily think some people are taught to succeed. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you talk about uh, the the book in the book you read. The author talks about walking through fire. Mm -hmm. um, can you maybe just give us one example of a way you've walked through fire at MCA? And um, have you seen the fruit of that, like, after? Yeah, so... <sighs> hmm. Pre-Cal <laughs> is definitely one of them. Um, I think senior year is just difficult because you have to be leaders. And so, like, walking through that fire, like, you, you have to walk through that fire because, like, you, you get older. And so times come when – times happen in our lives when that fire is in front of us and there's nothing else we can do. And so having to walk through that fire kind of goes into what I was talking about with the previous question about becoming sanctified. And, like, sure, this is in, like, a worldly sense, but, like, growing through that fire and uh, basically – growing ourselves through the fire which is in front of us uh that that we can't move if that makes no sense but <laughs> i think it does but i actually kind of disagree i think that um you can choose to not walk through that fire but i think that you've chosen to yeah and you've um become a better leader and young man because of it and so i think it's admirable that you don't see it as a choice and that you see it as a challenge that you're going to take on and become better for it regardless. So, yeah. Um, last one. Uh, you're at the end. You talk about um, perfectionism versus diligence. Um, I guess which side of that line do you think you fall on? And then, uh, well, I guess answer that one and then I'll ask a follow-up. I'm definitely not a perfectionist. <laughs> Anybody who knows me knows I'm not a perfectionist. Um, <laughs> But I am a hard worker, and like I'm willing to say that. Um, so yeah, I would say the diligent side of the line. Just like uh, Coach McMillan and I were talking one time about something, and he was talking about how like like a boxer, for example, who just keeps getting back up after getting knocked down, like Rocky. Um, and so yeah, that's what I would say. Like diligence is is just getting back up, getting back up, getting back up. And sometimes it's not going to equate to success. Like sometimes you're just going to have to fail. Um, but yeah, that's what I would say is the side of the line that I fall on. Yeah. Uh, I think that's good. Um, how do you think, uh, as a school, um, we can better encourage diligence over perfectionism? I think we do a good job, really. I remember my tour for MCA, uh, 
Mr. Z was talking about kind of the failure thing. Like that was a big part of the tour. Like kids have to learn to fail. Um, and so I know I keep going back to that, but yeah, I, I would say MCA does a good job of that. Um, I think, I think a lot of that is a personal thing. Like, I don't know if that's something that you can just like instill in kids like failure because people just don't want to fail. And I don't want to fail, even though I keep talking about like how good it is, <laughs> so, how good it is. But, um, yeah, people just don't want to fail. It's human nature not to want to fail. Um, so I don't think like you can necessarily instill that. I think they have to experience it. That's good. Thank you. All right. We have four minutes before I have to give you the mic. So, um, let's get to it. Um, you had a hot take in the back and you said MCA is so easy. Um, and so I want to hear, I want, I want you to clarify that comment. So this is a hot take. Um, <laughs> And I don't mean that the work is easy. Okay. Because the work is not easy. Okay. But it's it's easy to not fail. Okay. What, does it, what does it take? So to not I mean, fail. we have revisions, right? So we so, get seventy percent back on everything. Okay. And so if you, as long as you do those revisions, and we have tutors who care, so you could there's we have so many resources here that other schools don't. I would say it's easier. It's easier, and obviously every kid is different. Um, but for myself, when I'm not in a class with 50 kids or 40 kids, when I'm in a class with 14, yes. uh, and I have tutors who care and want to help us and want us to succeed, and we get revisions, I just think those resources, like... So it, what was the disconnect when you, when you were in eighth grade? I, I would say it's myself, okay. kind of like what I was talking about before. Like I didn't really know, I didn't really know what failure was like. It's kind of like we see all of these, like when, when we watch the NFL draft, for example, we yeah. see these quarterbacks who have never failed. Yeah. Like uh, Kyler Murray, uh, Trevor Lawrence. Like they've never lost. Like Trevor Lawrence, when he got drafted, I mean, he lost a few times at Clemson. But I've it's, watched sports before. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I was ranting I know, about I sports. I just, it was good. It was um, good. <laughs> but I think, like, I'm sure they learn more through their failure that first season in the NFL when they're thrown in the fire. Yeah, okay. Uh, and they have to learn to fail. And some of them come out of the fire, some of them don't. Okay. So I'm going to ask you something that's kind of personal. Um, so you were a senior mm -hmm. on the baseball team. You didn't get many starts. Yeah. Right? Okay. And so I'm not saying that to pick on you. I, when I was a senior in high school, I was on the football team. I didn't start a single game. Yeah. Okay. And so like that bothered me for a long time. And I look back now and there's a lot of things I've learned from that. What are some things that you learned this year from, from not getting a lot of starts? I, I think it taught me how to – even though I didn't get a lot of starts, it's been four years. I haven't gotten many starts. Okay. Um, it's taught me how to want something really bad mm -hmm. uh and also just like that like working hard and failing even if you know you're failing sometimes mm -hmm. like working through that you can better yourself through that and uh yeah i think and i've also just like learned more about the thing that i'm doing like whether it's baseball or school like sitting out of that and just watching it happen i've learned a lot from that too and okay so, well, I want to encourage you in that. Like, it, it's a real big disappointment to me that I've only had you this one year in class. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, and so I, I am glad that because you're a little off schedule, you're going to be in class next week. And so I'm, I'm going to be glad to see you there. Um, but, you know, you had my wife in class, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Sir. And so she'd always talk about how she, much she enjoyed having you in class. So the the reality is your your baseball story is coming to an end. Oh, yeah. It's you over. Know? And so <laughs> – but I, I want to encourage you as you move on. I mean, there's still going to be areas to be competitive, but mm -hmm. I would encourage you, like, you already have the heart for cooperation. And I really believe the Christian life is, I mean, there's obviously a competitive aspect to it, but it's like a team sport. And I think it's, it's really about cooperation. You already have that. You've really been a blessing um, in the great books this year. And just kind of your maturity and, and the things that you bring to the table. So I would encourage you to shift that. Like, don't make the mistake I did. I wasn't a believer, graduated from high school. 
I spent like four years trying to beat a ch beat people up at, at tackle football pickup because I needed to live out my dreams. <laughs> um, I would encourage you like to to grow and 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 be cooperative and run your race and bring other people along. You have it in you. Okay, sure. there's a lot there, and so I want to encourage you, and um, we're going to turn it over to you. But I just want to thank you for all that you brought to Great Books this year. It was a lot of fun. Yes, sir. Okay, so I have my questions, Mr. S question, questions for each of y'all. Just one individual question. Um, so for Mr. Snow first. So you enjoy sports. So what's one sporting event worldwide that you would want to go to? So just the event itself, it doesn't matter who's playing, I guess. So just to see I, the event. It, it can be teams that are playing or just an event. Uh, I would say the World Cup final would be a very cool one. Uh, it might, well, it's coming to the U.S. Uh, that's probably an expensive ticket, but that would be a very cool one to see uh, just the passion. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mrs. Gladson, so you were a student at MCA, and I know you were a student too. But I had another question for you. It was you. a lot longer ago than me, so. What was your. I cannot remember. You said it, not me. Just kidding. Okay, so you were a student at MCA. What was your favorite part of senior year? Oh, gosh. Mm. Well, originally, you, you told me you were going to ask me about the movie that I made. Oh, Film Furno? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, but I I didn't have anything to ask. It's there. Well, uh, <laughs> I will say that experience really bonded our class um, in a really, really special way. And it definitely robbed a lot from senior year because we had to work really hard on it. So I can't say that it's a bad thing that it's not around anymore. But um, it is a really cool thing to be able to pop in a DVD and watch all of us on screen together. Um, and if you ever talk to Mr. Bailey, he will talk probably for hours about that movie because he, he loved it so much. And um, so, yeah, it just was a unique um, thing to get to do with my class and something that I can still look back on. Yeah. And I think it was the best MCA movie I've seen. I thought they did a really good job. So I, I did it. too. It was, it was. Well, let me rephrase too. It was also the one I enjoyed watching. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Mr. Westfall, you like to read books. Yes. Especially <laughs> great books. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, out of all the books that we've read this year in great books, which one was your favorite, and which one was your least favorite? So, like in great books four. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sir. Um, mm, man, I would say, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to go with brothers. K, um, mm. is my favorite. Uh, I thought, uh, Logan did a great job uh, teaching it and, uh, just the, the heart of it. Like there's so much of the people. And so when, you know, you know, when one of the main characters dies, mm. yeah. it does, I know it's coming. I know every time and I cry every time. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, so I love it so much. I, I think it has so much heart, and so I, I think it's great. And so I, I, I would encourage any any seniors here who skipped through it um, and didn't read it at a later date, go back and read it, listen to the audio book, contemplate it, talk with somebody about it. Uh, that's the best. Um, then what would the, the least that I would like? Um, it, for me, would be Kant. Oh, yeah. um, and so I, I can't take it anymore. Uh <laughs> Yeah, I, I really don't care for um, these philosophers too much. I know we, I know why we read them, and I think it's important to be exposed to them. But for for a Christian who's already knows the truth, you know, I got saved when I was 22, and so like I looked at those first 22 years before that of like, what was I doing with life? And so now that I've seen the truth, whenever some philosopher comes by and like, oh, no, no, put all that away. I've got the truth. I'm just like, get out. <laughs> um, so I, I really don't enjoy that. And that, so mm -hmm. I, I love the so much in Brothers K of how Christ comes out through that book. So, yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we'll release you. Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for Thaden. Thank you for his family, Lord, and, and the work that you're doing uh, in and through him. Um, thank you for all those that have come to support him today. And uh, just thank you, Lord, for the privilege uh, of getting to know each other. 
uh, to run this race together. And I pray that you would help us, uh, Lord, to um, just exhort one another to love and good works and that we'd finish the race that you've set before each of us. So I pray for your hand of, upon Thaden and that you would bless him as he goes forth. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Part. You're done. Oh, is the mic still on? Yeah, it's <laughs>